but I wanted to prepare something a little bit more explicit about the difference between find and logical indexing um, for topic four. Remember, this is the one that you're going to be taking a quiz on. Um, so remember, the idea is that if you use just logical indexing, so this is an array of numbers, and then I put in a condition x is less than or equal to 40, the um, logical indexing just gives you zeros and ones, which then can be put back into the array to get the values where there are ones. The find command is very similar. It's just that the output of the find command gives location values rather than ones and zeros, mm -hmm. but can be used exactly the same. It can be plugged back into the array to show only the values where you've indicated a location. The reason both of those methods work is because this is, remember, a Boolean data type. That's what comes out of the logical indexing call. And this is a number. So if you're going to do numbers, they have to be elements. So zero wouldn't work because zero is not an element. If you're going to do Boolean, zeros and ones are the only option. Um, in the second question, yeah. Now, why is it that you have to have M is an M of I? Um, this is a variable, um, this is an array creator. It's creating an array one by one. So when I is one, it's going to fill in the first element of M with three. And so if you don't give it a call to the index, it doesn't know where to place it in the array. And we're going to be doing a lot of that. Any other questions about this? Um, what's the point of the R in front of count? So this is doing the same thing. It's created an array R. Oh. Yep, and count is the index for this one. They're both doing the same thing. Any other questions? Sorry, I'll try to remember to repeat the questions at the front row. Um, what's the purpose of the find command? It's defining the value of that element as 5. So it's just going to create an array that has three elements, they're all five. <laughs> it's a pretty bad code, but that's what it does. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so we started loops last time, and I um, have selected an expert in the field to describe it to you in maybe a more useful way. My son, Burke. This is him last year, so he is very little. He was two breaks my heart a little bit to see this video that we made last year, but he's going to demo for you for and while loops. Get, get ready. Are you ready? Okay. Burke, run around the basketball hoop three times. So he's showing you a for One. loop. It's a for loop. Two. <laughs> three. That was three times. Now See how Burke, happy he is? Run around basketball hoop until I say stop. Ready? Wall loop. Go. <laughs> stop! <laughs> so, if Burke can do it, I think you can do it. And also, tr this is true, um, while loops are a little bit more fun than for loops, which he showed you. He was way, it was way more fun to anticipate when it's going to stop, right? So this is what we learned. Two different types of loops. He probably would still do this, actually, but he was way cuter then. Um, <laughs> no, he's still super cute. I'm just saying, this was a big deal for him. Okay, so remember a for loop is when you know that you need to repeat a set of the commands a predetermined amount of time. So the only tricky part about for loops is that the way that the syntax is is that you have to set up the number of times as an array. While loops, on the other hand, run a set of commands until a condition is met. It's very different. And so remember that the while loop condition needs to be true in order for the loop to be executed. So those are the two things that we learned. We also talked about if, else if, and else um, statements. Um, and all three of those are going to be needed for lab five. You need to use all three different types in order to write the code for lab five. Um, and if, else statements, remember, they just check a condition. And if the condition is true, 
the code in between the if or the else if and the um, next else or the end are executed. So it's a one-time check. But if you place them inside a for loop, you can check multiple things. Um, you can check things many times in a row. And then the last thing that we talked about that's really important is memory allocation. So we talked about building arrays using loops. So here is <coughs> the method one that I showed you, which is defining a V array inside a loop, element by element, building it. And remember that the problem with this is that it's refining memory every single time the loop is executed for that V array. So instead, you always want to pre-allocate the size of the array and then fill it in inside the loop. Or if possible, you can use vector notation and do it all in one line, but sometimes that's not possible and that's why you have the loop um, capability. All right, the last thing I wanted to review today is um, four things, four ways to do the same exact thing. And I want you to, I want to encourage you to start thinking about your code this way. Um, all four of these things are just doing a mean. So I have, um, I have two arrays. Uh, oh, I have it up here. So I have an array A and it has two, um, two rows. The first row has one, two, three. The second row has four, five, six. And I want you to multiply the first row by the second row and then take the mean of all three of those. So the bottom one here is the cleanest one. It does it in one line. It basically multiplies those two rows together using the dot operator. So it does it all at once. And then it takes and just inserts that into the mean. This one is the worst one. It hard codes the call. So it takes the first and second <coughs> elements, which are the first and second, so it goes like this. And then it's a one um, coordinate call, so it's doing them one at a time. And then it calls them again to add them and then divides them by three. So it's not using any functions. It's doing everything implicitly by calling. This one's a little bit better because it uses the two index notation, so it's a little bit easier to tell that you're in the right row or column. And then this one here, does the calculation first using vector operations, and then it does a sum and a length. But with all of these things, there's all these different ways that you're gonna be doing different things, and we're trying to get you to this fourth way of doing it the most efficient way. But I just wanna tell you that it's more important to me that you actually understand what you're programming. So if you need to go more in this direction and do it more inefficiently because it makes sense to you and you actually understand your code, I would encourage you to do that. Um, does that make sense? Okay, so what we're going to be doing today is uh, two loops, and the first one is going to be particularly similar to lab five. So um, I'm going to, this is kind of, this is a, a type of problem that almost everyone can understand the algorithm for, which is a grade sorter. So the idea is that um, we are going to have an array that holds a set of numeric scores and we are going to go through all those scores and first categorize the scores as letter grades like A, B, C, D, E, and F. So that's step A that I have listed already here. We're then going to apply a counting algorithm and count um, how many scores fit within each grade range. So how many A's were there? How many B's were there? And then um, the last thing that we're gonna do that I'm doing mostly because it helps with lab five is we're going to apply a curve to the grade distribution. So the idea is, I don't know if any of your professors curve your grades, um, but the idea is that when you curve grades, typically you need to curve differently depending on the score. So maybe the people who are in the A range just get like a one point boost, people in the B range are going to get like a three point boost, etc. Um, that's typically how curves are implemented. So we are going to incorporate a curve into the grade so that you can kind of see how you can do that variable definition. 
So the way that I'm going to show you this is by following the procedure that's laid out on the, on the um, end of every single pre-lab right here. So this is the part of the class where this procedure is very important. I think the most common thing that we see at this time in the class is people come to lab and they say, I have no idea how to do this or something like something similar to that. And that's why these steps are laid out to kind of get you to start thinking through the process of how to solve this code. That's not supposed to be like an intimidating thing. It's just like people feel like it's kind of like an overwhelming task to tackle some of these programming assignments. And so this is a way to give you some direct things to do. So the first step of the process is to read the problem, which we already did. And then the second step is to develop steps that you yourself would, would do to solve the problem. So they're called human style steps. So for example, the first thing that you would need in order to do this algorithm is you would need the scores right? You would need access to the scores that you're trying to categorize. So that's step one. Um, step two is that you're going to need the ranges. So by that it means you need to know what is the categorization of, of letter grade per score. So we're not going to be super careful about greater than, equal to, and stuff like that, but just know that every 10-point range is going to be a letter grade. And I'll put the equals in when I write the code, but for now we're just going to write it in general. So once you have those sort of the data and the conditions, then um, what would you do? So let's say I'll write out some scores that we can start thinking about and I'll just write it in MATLAB code. So here is a list of scores that you're trying to categorize. So if you were a human, which you are, right? There's a delay. I have something to tell you. You're all humans. And um, the first thing that you would do is you would start with the first grade and you would check to see which category it was, right? So the first thing you would do is check first score and determine which range. <coughs> it falls into. So one of the goals of this assignment is to, once you know which range it falls into, one of the things that you want to do is um, uh, save uh, associated letter grade. So you want to know what letter corresponds with that range. The second thing you want to do is you want to count it. So perhaps you want to keep track of the number of A's so you have some like category where you're keeping track of that and then you're adding to it every time you find a new one. And then the last thing is that you would want to apply a curve according to a condition. So let's just write out what the conditions might be. So for A grades, let's add 1. For B, for B grades, let's add 3. For C grades, let's add 5. And then for D grades, 7. And F grades, 9. So we'll do that with the first element. We'll save the letter grade associated with that element. We'll, we'll start a counter. We'll apply a curve, depending on which one it is. And then what would you do after you did the first element? You would do the next element. So you would basically go ahead and repeat 3 for all elements. 
for I'll just for all scores. Okay, and then usually part of every algorithm or every code that you're writing um, requires some sort of report of your results. In most cases, it's going to be a plot for us. Sometimes it's displaying to the screen, but always you need to incorporate some way to show what the result is, right? So that's what you want to start with is writing out these steps, and then you want to start converting these steps into computer style, things that the computer can do. So for example, we'll go back to step one. If you need the scores, that's going to require a variable definition. That one's easy, right? We can do that. Uh, the, the ranges. How do you put in conditions in MATLAB? What is that called? If conditions and what are what do you use in the if condition? What kind of operators do you use? Yeah, you need to create relational and logical statements, right? So these are just ranges. So you need to convert them to relational conditions that MATLAB can then interpret, right? So you need to use greater than, less than, stuff like that. So um, then our first step in, in three is a check. So anytime you need to check something, what do you want to think? What, what construction do we use to check? An if statement. So we're going to need an if statement. And then um, each of these is going to require a different thing. So this one is just going to be a variable definition. So we're going to have a variable that saves the string associated with each category. Um, the um, count is going to be a counter. We've already done this algorithm. It's where you initialize something to one, and then you just do count equals count plus one. That'll just be a counter for each of the um, grade ranges. And then a curve is going to be a uh, change, uh, or I guess you could call it a algebraic manipulation of an already existing variable. So you already know what the score is. Score on element 1 is 60, but you're going to change that score. You're going to access it and then change it and then replace it. Okay? So that's what that last one is going to do. And who can tell me, when you see the word repeat, what do I want you to think? Loop. And what kind of loop is this? For loop or while loop? This is a for loop because we know how many times we need to do this. How many times do we need to do it? However many scores there are, the length of the array. So this is what you want to start with. Oh, and then for this one, we'll just do a, a, disk, a disk statement to report the results. Once you've kind of sorted out um, this, sorted out your steps, converted them to computer equivalent steps. You know all the different things that you need, and now the next step is to put it in the right order. It doesn't go in this order. You don't put the if statement here, and then a variable definition, and then the for loop at the bottom, right? It all needs to be nested in a way that makes sense. So the way that I would recommend that you start thinking about this is um, this is what we call a pseudocode, and it's where you don't really provide all of the detail of the algorithm, but you at least get it sorted out. So for example, we know that we're going to need to define the scores first. We need those first, so you're going to kind of get that on your paper. And I actually like to go from relational statements out, because I think it makes the most sense. So we know that we're going to have a bunch of if statements, and the if statements are going to be checking um, particular values of the array. So for example, we're going to check if the score is greater than 90. And then we're going to check if the score is less than 90. And uh, greater than, I'll do it, I'll do the greater than on this one. 
greater than or equal to 80. So 80 is included in the B range, 90 <laughs> is included in the A range. So that'd be an else if. And you're just going to continue that else if sequence all the way down. So you don't have to write it all out. You know, you're just getting a pseudocode together. Then wrapped around that if statement, you're going to need to have a for loop. And the for loop is going to run through all of the elements of the array. So this is where I told you before, you're going to start writing your for loops to just run through one colon length of the array that you're trying to look at. So this kind of gets you your structure, if statement inside, for loop on the outside. Question? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I think technically you don't. That's right. Yeah, you don't need this and statement because it's already been shown false if it went to the else if statement. Um, yeah, it's probably over constrained this way. Something shown true, it, it, it exits the if statement. That's right. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, so then inside each if statement, you're going to need to do a few things. One is you're going to need to create um, a cell array. Uh, and I'm not going to be careful about s syntax right now. I'll, I'll worry about that when I get to the code. But I need to somehow create another array that holds the, <laughs> the letter grade because I asked it to categorize each score as a letter grade. I'm going to need a counter that is going to be initialized somewhere else in the code. And then it's going to be advanced every time the condition is true that it's counting. So that's um, step one and step two. And then the last thing is applying the curve. So the curve is going to access. So it's going to access the score that it's checking. It's going to add the curve that applies to that grade item, which was a one for A's. And then it's going to replace the score with that new curved grade. So this is um, a very typical algorithm. I call it a find algorithm. It's basically a loop with an if statement that's locating conditions, but you can do a lot of different things inside a find algorithm. So this is creating a new variable, it's providing a counter, and it's adjusting um, a value that you're checking. So it's doing a lot of things, and it's all kind of the same algorithm. Uh, you're going to do a couple different assignments where that's what it is. Um, in your code that you're going to do for lab one, this is the same structure you're going to start with, but there's also going to be a while loop nested around your whole for if statement that is going to check another thing to see if another thing is true. And that's the only thing that's really different about that algorithm. So if we want to type this code out really quick, this code, um, requires this variable definition first. And there's a couple things I want to point out as I program this for you, just a couple like techniques of how to code. So the first thing that I want you to kind of get into the habit of is whenever we're doing all these wrappers, like for loops, if statements, you want to complete the wrapper when you first type it. So did you see how I, I typed for and then I immediately put the end. It just helps with debugging. So um, the for loop that we wrote, we actually wrote in pretty proper syntax. So I'm going to go ahead and just type in what we wrote. We're going to have the loop run for the entire length of the scores. And then we're just going to create a bunch of if statements that are going to check each of the conditions. Um, so before I start filling in what's in between, I'm going to write in all of these wrappers. So I need one, two, three, four, five. So I can choose to use the else statement for the F students, um, or for the F scores, or I can just create a, a last condition. It's over constrained, but it's fine for this um, assignment, for this, what we're doing here. The other thing I want to show you is how I'm copy and pasting. I'm not going to retype things that are repetitive. I'm going to reuse things that I've already done so that I don't make mistakes. Like I already typed this correctly, so I'm just, I mean, unless you make it incorrect and then you copy and paste it, that's super annoying, but that's okay. I think I wrote it correctly. 
So I'm just checking if it's greater than, and technically I think this would be sufficient for the condition. I think you could just keep checking what's greater than, but we'll add the other one just to be sure that it also needs to be less than the one above it. So again, I'm just going to copy and paste this so that I have it on each one. Does that look right? Did I make any mistakes? Probably shouldn't use a file name that's the same as one of my variable names, so don't do what I just did, um, but it will be fine. So let's start with just doing a counter. So what I'm going to do is I could create three variables, or I'm sorry, five variables for for each count, because I need to have, I need to count five different things: A, B, C, D, and F. Right? I have five things to count, so I could just create five variables. This is hurts my heart a lot to do this, but I'm going to show it to you because it's probably less complicated, but to to understand. But it's way more complicated to debug and write. So what I'll do then is under each if statement, I'm just going to do that counter. This is the easiest one. So I'm just going to add a counter for each one. And now I have to go in and change each one. The, op the option that you can do that's a little easier is you can create an, a counter that's in a whole array. And that would um, simplify the coding a little bit. You have a question? Yes, we do. That would make so much more sense. So yeah, definitely start your counters at zero. Um, the, we sometimes count counters, start counters at one if it's a counter for a loop, because the loop always starts at one. Um, but in this case, we should definitely count them, start them at zero. So we have our counters plugged in. Um, the other thing that we were doing was this uh, other array that I'm going to create called letter that's going to save the associated letter grade for each score. So this is going to create a cell array and put in each element of the cell array the associated letter. Can anyone tell me what I should be doing before I do this? Yeah, we definitely need to pre-allocate. Pre-allocating cell arrays is a little bit trickier. You have to use the cell command. Um, so Above here, let's go over to the command window to see that we know how to do this. So if you do cell and then you put in 1 by 5, and then if I do letter parentheses 1 equals A, I can see that that seems to be working, right? It's, it seems to be creating a cell array. So in order to preallocate, I'm just going to tell it how many elements are in that cell array. So letter equals cell 1, colon, 1 comma 5. And that is going to have to be something that's hard-coded the way that we wrote it because we have five categories. You could generalize that with a second loop, but we're not doing that. And then the last thing that we're doing is we are going to um, do the curve. So that's the last thing. So the curve is going to access the score that satisfied that condition, and then it's going to apply whatever curve was decided, and then it's going to replace the value of the score with that curve. So you'll notice that the way that we've done this is that the curve is going to be applied after the categorization happens. So your categorization is on the original scores, not on the curved scores, but you could definitely adjust your code so that it would be able to do it differently. For example, you could apply a while loop around the whole thing, and maybe you set the while loop to keep doing this curve until you have 10 A's or something, until you have some condition that you're trying. Does this like make you think this is what we do to like get the grades to be not horrible distribution? It's not, but like you could do this. You could like algorithmically normalize all of your grades. Um, so yeah, and then at the end, we're gonna want to look at all the different things that we've defined. So I'm gonna go outside the for loop by the way, the other thing that I'm doing that's really bad right now is I haven't run this code even one time and I've typed like 50 lines of code. That's also a really bad habit to get in because there's probably a lot of bugs. Let's find them together. You should you should probably like write the if statement. Check. Did you find a bug already? Um, does it? Yeah. Maybe. Let's see. Um, Let's see. 
doesn't letter depend on scores in um, on those like like the like the um, those three allocations in the graphic box and spell it? <coughs> Oh, good. Yeah, it should be the length of scores. That's exactly right. Yeah, so there'll be um, one letter grade in the cell array for every score. That's true. Let's let's see how many other things there's wrong. Okay. So I printed everything. So I I ran this. This is so stupid. Uh, okay. So it ran it and um, a letter is seven big it has a grade for every score it has three a's three a's <laughs> i never changed those wait i did why did I print them why did I print that so many times hold up hold up oh do you know what's happening you guys it's because i used the same the same file name okay bad idea because it was printing scores, I think. There we go. That's a really confusing thing to see. So it printed out the letter cell array. That looks correct. It counted three A's. Looks like there's three A's. Two B's. Looks like there's two B's, um, etc. And then here's the curved scores that are adjusted based off of that curve. So this is like the basic structure that your code is going to be. It's very, very similar. The only thing that you're going to change is when you write your code and start getting it together. Totally different problem, by the way. When you read it, you're going to be like, what? That has nothing to do with letter grade scores. But the algorithm is actually pretty much exactly the same. So you're going to have a while loop around it. And I wanted to show you a couple of these things on your assignment directly so that we can make sure that we're preparing. So there's a couple things I want you to look at before you come to lab. So first, this example that I'm now recording and I just told you about. Super great example. Second is the pre-lab. The pre-lab has you write a couple codes and uh, little short codes and those also help you with getting the lab set up. But there's a couple of new things in the lab that we haven't done yet. So the first thing is this idea of using image SC. So let me show you really quick what image SC does. So So I just created an array um, that has four, it's a four by four array and it has just a bunch of random numbers in it. I mean, it's not actually random, there's an algorithm that just produced this. But um, let's say I wanted to visualize that array, array and look at what those values look like. If you do a contour plot of the array, which we've done in the past for plotting, that actually um, flips the array. It flips it upside down. So the bottom row of the picture is not the bottom row of the array. So what we're going to use instead for visualizing our array so you can actually see it is something called image SC. And what image SC does if you add a color bar is it colors each array or each cell by um, its associated value. So in your lab that you're going to be working on, um, this lab here, you're creating a population growth algorithm. So you're going to basically have a... Uh, uh, 100 by 100 array and all the array is going to have in it is either every cell is either going to be a 1 or a 0. A 1 cell means that that cell is alive and a 0 cell means that that cell is dead and so when you do image SC of the 1's and zeros, the alive cells will be colored a different color than the dead cells and so it allows you to watch the algorithm as it reproduces, kills, survives um, each generation of life uh, inside that while loop that you're writing. So that's new. That's something that you haven't done before. And you'll have to look at the tips here that you're going to create a plot. You're going to create an animation plot. So the plot's going to change as the loop runs. So you're going to have to use a pause or a draw now statement after the plot and, because otherwise the loop runs faster than the plot and you'll never see the image. Do you have a question? Um, for this assignment, yes. you choose. So the assignment, the, the way that this algorithm works is you write the algorithm and the goal is to run the algorithm so that your population never dies off. 
So the, the trick is that you have to start with an ideal population distribution um, that makes it so that it survives. And there's a lot of options. There's not just one. So you're just going to initialize your array to all zeros and then pick like five to ten cells to turn on. You pick, you pick them yourself and you're going to have to try a bunch of different options until you get your population to be stable. You guys have any other questions about it? Yeah. Just set it to something that makes the while loop true. So just like if, yeah. So the condition will be that there's no dead cells or, or there's no live cells, right? So just set it equal to three. Anything that makes it true. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thanks.